order. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Frank Atelli. Present. Hairston. Here. Cleveland. Present. Griffin. Here. Bashir Jones. Here. McCormick. Present. Slife. Present. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. The Development Planning Sustainability Committee hearing is being held during a COVID-19 emergency declaration in accordance with Ohio's open meeting laws as amended by HB 404. This meeting is being held using the Zoom platform and is being live streamed on YouTube and on Cleveland's Channel 20. It could also be seen on Cleveland City Council website and from Council's Facebook page. In accordance with Ohio open meeting regulations as amended by HB 404, notice of this committee hearing was publicly posted. This committee hearing will be conducted as all committee hearings in accordance with the Roberts Rules of Order and City Council rules. The chair will facilitate the meeting and call on persons to speak. If you wish to speak, please use the raise your hand option on Zoom and please limit your comments to the matters before today's committee. As is the usual practice, any actions to be voted on during this committee will be done by voice vote, voice vote called and recorded by the committee clerk as required by Rule 15. The first piece of legislation, this is a uh, part of our public meetings for uh, zoning. And the first piece of legislation that we have in front of us um, is ordinance number 63-2019 by council member Spencer, uh, replacing existing map setbacks along the east side of West 65th Street and both sides of Herman Avenue between West 65th and West 54th with zero map setbacks and establishing zero map setbacks from the blocks south of Breakwater Avenue and Cass Avenue, south to Herman Avenue between West 65th and West 54th Street, map change 2589. This was originally introduced by council member zone um, in 2019. Um, and uh, I think uh, Shannon, uh, you're gonna be uh, reviewing this legislation? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. Can I share my screen? Uh, yes, please. Okay. You have to allow, oh, there we go. Can you see it? That's it. Can you see the screen? Not yet. Uh oh. Let's try again. There we go. Okay, perfect. Let's go from the beginning. Click on full screen. All right, there we go. Can you see it now? Got it, thank you. <laughs> All right, perfect. So just a little context, this was brought before uh, Planning Commission back in October, 2018, and it was introduced to your uh, council uh, in January of 2019. Um, it was a request through Councilman Zone. Um, you should have a support letter, as, as you know, all legislation um, has to have support of you all council. Um, so really the proposal, as you said, was to replace the existing five foot and 10 foot specific map setbacks that are already existing with zero foot map setbacks from the property line. Um, this is really just to align uh, the existing and proposed map setbacks of zero feet with the predominant setbacks on the surrounding blocks um, so that we can preserve the massing and character of a dense walkable neighborhood near the lake uh, for future development. Um, as you may remember, uh, specific map setbacks, every property within the city of Cleveland typically has setbacks, but specific map setbacks are a front yard, a required front yard space where no building or structure may be located, except where specifically allowed by the zoning code. Um, they're indicated on our building zone maps, uh, either from the property line or from the street center line. They take precedence of all other zone uh, setback re regulations, and they can only be changed through legislation like this. Um, so what you see here on the screen in red is existing five foot map setbacks and the green lines that you see along West 65th are existing 10 foot map setbacks. Um, our proposal here is to add zero foot map setbacks and I kind of walk you through why that is the case along West 65th and Breakwater. 
Now, this map is a little bit old. North of Breakwater, you currently have uh, the Edison Project. So along West 65th, uh, if you notice the green lines on the right-hand side of the screen on the map, those are 10-foot specific map setbacks. But on those first four properties south of Herman, uh, th there's a 10-foot specific map setback. We're proposing zero foot just because the massing and care to the street is already to the lot line at a zero foot setback. This is really important also along the south side of Herman on those few properties, there's a current five foot map setback, but again, some of those properties come right to the lot line. You'll also notice that those parcels are fairly shallow coming from the south side of Herman. Um, and so should anything ever happen to these properties, a fire or any other act of God, uh, to be built back to the way that they're currently built on those shallow lots, uh, having a zero foot setback will allow the maximum flexibility. And so really the impetus, as you may remember from this, this original proposal that was announced at Planning Commission back in October 2018 was for Edison 2, NRP project, Breakwater 2, excuse me, um, on the old um, industrial properties south of Breakwater. Now the current project, the currently stands are the warehouse units that are still there um, and they are also at the zero foot lot line. Um, and so really the proposal here is you know, for any new projects that come along that they fit into any type of infill development would uh, really help with the pedestrian friendliness of the property, as well as to continue any new development would go, would meet the character north of Breakwater, where you can already see uh, that there's homes there involved uh, that are close to the lot line. Now, zero foot setback doesn't mean that they have to build to the lot line and any new infill development would have to go through planning commission or housing design review or community development and also meet the character of the street. So they don't necessarily have to come to that lot line, but that does give them the maximum flexibility. So again, this is the area between Cass and West 54th and West 58th. You'll notice most of the properties in this area also come to the lot line. So we're proposing zero foot setbacks just to really match the character and massing of the street. Along West 54th on the east, west side, excuse me, those houses, since there's currently some properties already there, they would still have to meet the character of the street and be in line with those uh, properties. So again, we are proposing zero foot setbacks in this area. Um, another context just to put out there, there is some proposals, as you'll notice on the south side of Breakwater, there, it is a semi-industry district. And so any type of new development or redevelopment um, or renovations, we really just wanna make sure or additions to these properties that they meet the intent of the code as well as the neighborhood and the character of this neighborhood, the massing, the scale, et cetera, in terms of um, promoting walkability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is the public portion of the meeting. And uh, we did get one letter in, um, and I also um, had uh, received some comments. Um, this is from uh, Gregory Scott, <clears throat> uh, and uh, he would like, he's uh, saying, I would like to start by informing the commission that I received your notice about 28 hours before the deadline to comment. I know that uh, two other people in this target area also received their notices approximately the same time. Um, I am against the proposed a proposal to allow zero setbacks. Uh, one building to the sidewalk creates a more congested aesthetic for the neighborhood. Uh, two, Adam wrote in an email to me, this is not rezoning, but a regulation allowing future buildings to be built closer to the street, much like the current industrial buildings already in place. How this justifies allowing the same for future development escapes me. And yes, there are a number of old buildings that go right to the sidewalk. They create a less pleasant neighborhood as they block views and crowd the sidewalk. And why would the city want to allow more of the same? And three, uh, developers are covering every inch of land with non-permeable materials. Uh, case in point, uh, Kyan Park is built within three feet of the sidewalk and has only a few square feet of grass in the northwest corner. Um, all the rest of the property is covered with buildings and concrete. A normal setback would at least leave a little green permeable land. Is the city requiring water, water runoff reservoirs? And is there any requirement for green space to improve aesthetics and air quality? Um, also, I am a supporter of new housing in this area, but I would like to see it done with some priority placed on the environment and um, psychology of, of, whole, of urban space. 
sorry, uh, light printing on my printer, sorry. Um, and finally, as far as I can see, uh, developers are the only beneficiaries of allowing serial setbacks. I urge the committee to consider the ordinance in terms that include holistic neighborhood planning balanced against economic development. Um, sincerely, Greg Scott. Um, and that was the only formal uh, letter that we received in place. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Ms. Beatty, um, can you answer the uh, two questions that he uh, poses in here? Is the city requiring water runoff reservoirs? So that is something that planning and zoning, some of the planners may work on those types of projects, but for zoning, I specifically work on zoning legislation. Um, and so I'm sure that in the design review process that they do tackle landscaping um, and how water flows, et cetera. Um, Mr. Davenport is the neighborhood planner for this area. And I'm not sure if he's on the call, um, but he may be able to specifically answer those questions regarding the environment. Adam? I don't believe Adam's on the call today. Okay. I know that he had spoke of uh, wanting to be here. So, but in terms of the environment, uh, you know, that's a mix between design review, the CDC, you know, when projects do come before the uh, planning commission for new development. Okay. And, uh, and the other part, and I guess that's part of the other part of the question, is there any requirement for green space to improve the aesthetics and air quality? But then again, that would again be part of that design review process. Yeah, and they do require landscaping and green space in large projects, generally. Um, so uh, uh, we have with us uh, Councilwoman Spencer. Um, Councilman, if you would like to speak on this. Thank you, Mr. I'm sorry, uh, I, I need to uh, close the public portion and open uh, back to committee, uh, Council, Councilwoman Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, some comments, but but prior to that, two two questions. One, uh, Shannon, for you, would you mind going back a few slides to the slide that indicated the existing setbacks in the area, the current? Um, I was I think there's one slide prior maybe. So this is only showing a portion of the site or of the proposed um, area to have for change setbacks. So I'm wondering why we only are able to see the, the current existing setbacks for 65th and Herman, not Breakwater, Cass, 58th, which are also included. I'm just curious how much of a change that would be and why this wasn't included in the current conditions map. So these are existing map setbacks. So you have different types of setbacks. Every single property, depending on use, if it's residential or institutional age uh, occupancy, has front yard, rear yard, side yard, and side street yard requirements. Um, but there's also what we call specific map setbacks. And those are on our building zone maps across the city. Um, they're in several places. So these are the actual specific maps that, map setbacks that are on our building zone maps. Um, and so you don't have these on every street. So if you had an address on the south side of Breakwater um, and you did not have a specific map setback, your front yard setback typically in a district that's not industrial would be 15% of the average lot line. So those, pro those properties, if they remained industrial, uh, the front yard setback is, is what, it, what it is currently is or zero feet already. So we're just putting in established map setbacks. Again, along Cass and West 54th and West 58th, I believe that's the address, sorry. Uh, West 58th and West 61st is adding that specific map setback just to keep the character of those blocks already that are already established and really just legislating it. Um, okay. So the reason why you don't see a red line or green line or yellow line for any other type of specific map setback along the breakwater and the cast area is because those are those don't exist currently. Um, and so along cast, if um, that wasn't industrial also say that was residential or local retail, the uh, specific, the map set, the, the setback, the front yard setback for those lots would be 15% of the average depth of the lot, as well as the rear uh, setback would be 15% of the average depth of the lot. Um, and so that's why they're not on this existing mapped building setbacks map. Okay, thank you. Sorry. 
No, thank you for the explanation. That's helpful. It's thank kind you. of in the weeds. No, that I, that's what we're here for. <laughs> uh, my a second question would be just procedurally. I do I do appreciate that there's public notice given for um, this the, these meetings and that time is allotted for public comment. Generally speaking, um, I will just going forward want to work with this committee to make sure. Uh, I think residents were concerned. They felt that that notice was a little, um, they wished they had, had received more notice. So um, Chairman Brancatelli, I'll speak with you about that, about how I can assist in the future with, with notice or Shannon, perhaps you can respond. Yeah, so can I respond? So this was a, um, this was a proposal that went before planning commission back in 2018 uh, with Councilman Zone. Um, and there was some community uh, discussion at that time prior to ever going to planning commission. And again, I guess in early 2019, and then it kind of just fell to the wayside because the um, NRP project kind of just kind of dissolved. They couldn't make the finances work due to, um, I guess, anything to do with like those industrial buildings. Um, and so it kind of just fell to the wayside. And then right before Councilman Zone left office, I believe he placed this on the agenda just because this legislation was just kind of waiting in the wings. Um, and so it kind of surprised me as well to be back on this agenda. Um, but again, you know, it's just legislation that's been introduced, it's been written. Um, and so it just needed to follow the formal process. And it wasn't in any way trying to um, not inform anybody or anything like, you know, or the community or anything like that. Because as you know, um, Councilwoman Spencer, you know, from other rezonings, it's typically there's a community process that we follow prior to it to going to planning commission or prior to seeing the you guys here at council. Um, and so I do apologize if there seemed there was some type of <laughs> like missteps or anything. Um, again, it oh, kind wow. of surprised me as well to be back on the agenda just because it's been it's been so long that this rezoning was out there, really. Yeah, not at all. Again, yeah, and I, and I think that a councilman was speaking more to the timing of a notice being sent and given the uh, timing of the post office these days, we, you know, we, we were required for 10 day notification to, to do a mailing of public notice 10 days prior. But with the mailing uh, these days, um, it does end up shrinking that, that notice time. Um, and so, and so councilman, we will work on that and uh, work with Ms. Kimberly on uh, how we, how we time some of these, especially for something that's been older and as uh, Shannon mentioned, had been stale for uh, over a year now. And since the project has gone away, um, uh, we'll, we'll have to look at how we do these mailings. Thanks everyone. I, I will add, um, I'm also in receipt of Mr. Scott's objection that uh, the chairman read. And then I also received two phone calls from residents who didn't submit anything in writing, but expressed similar concerns. And, um, I think we're just, this is an interesting one because as you all mentioned, it was sort of, it, you know, it was kind of in limbo. It wasn't moving forward in, in, a, in a process, but just was kind of sitting to the side and then what, what to do next. Um, I don't have strong feelings about this legislation moving forward at this time because there is not an imminent project. The NRP phase two um, on the south side of Breakwater is is not moving forward. It is I am in um, good contact with the owner of Premium Metals, the the major landholder there. He's not indicated any uh, you know there's no development pressure at this time or or desire to move forward with the project. Um, the site that is encompassed largely by West 58th and Cass Avenue and Herman Avenue is a future development site, but I think that. That developer um, who, who owns jointly owns the property there is very seasoned and would be very prepared and capable of, you know, a number of, as, as Shannon mentioned, there's a lot of different types of review that, that occur, especially with large scale projects. And uh, I think they would present, and we're talking years down the road. And, and also, as we all know, there's a lot, you know, these are uncertain times and we don't know, I think, any, it's anyone's guess as to when development might occur there. There is site control, but, uh, but, but no imminent timeline. And I think that that developer would present a thoughtful site plan. We would have a robust community engagement process and it would really um, allow the community to feel that they know what's happening in their own backyard. And I, I really trust that 
that developer would present something that is creative, innovative, that helps meet the uh, you know, urban form. Um, as I agree with you, we wanna keep the character of our neighborhood, you know, an urban neighborhood, we wanna keep um, density where we have it, we wanna keep that, that urban form where we have it. So I think um, the Ward 15 office, I, I, you all know working with Councilman Zone, he was uh, passionate about um, you know, development and it, it working in the right way for the community. He was very involved. I think when you're talking about large scale development sites like this, I would anticipate a lot of involvement from me, from this office and from many others to make sure there's outstanding um, results for the community. So I don't see a particular reason to do a kind of blanket map setback at this time. Um, uh, Shannon, you had your hand up and want to make a comment and uh, Carrie yeah. McCormick would like to speak. I think so this I part of the reason why I think this popped back on the agenda was there along this corner here um, there is a proposal out it's not gone through planning commission or anything for self storage in this neighborhood and self storage is a permitted use in semi industry and I think some of that proposal and Miss Spencer you might have more information on this than I do. Um, but I think that was part of the impetus for this coming back on the agenda was that any new development or um, renovations of this building to kind of, you know, there's a lot of housing right here and making sure that it fits the character that's continued to be walkable and not become like, you know, mass truck traffic and, you know, people pulling in and out. You know, obviously self storage is not the busiest type of business, <laughs> um, but there is, I think there was some concerns and that's why this probably popped back up on your agenda um, here. So just to put that out there. If, if I can, Councilman, uh, Councilman McCormick, uh, raise his hand. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm not going to speak to the specifics of this project. I'll yield to Councilwoman Slife, or, oh my gosh, Spencer, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning. <laughs> to uh, Councilman Spencer on, uh, on the specifics of this project. I just wanted to make a, just a brief comment, Chair, um, in general, how I think in the context of urban redevelopment, uh, we, we focus a lot on the environment, which is absolutely appropriate. Um, and I think our green building standards are a really key part of that. And we should be looking to partner, um, you know, in general with the sewer district and otherwise on these issues. But I do wanted to note though, that one of the pieces we often miss is how unbelievably devastating suburban sprawl is to the environment and how when we continue to build out and out and out versus in the city, the incredible uh, uh, devastation on the environment that causes for utilities, water, electrical runoff. Um, so in the context of this conversation, I would be remiss if I didn't just put my two cents in there that uh, reinvestment in the urban core is more, env and more environmentally friendly fundamentally versus um, you know, the sprawl that we've seen plague our region for the past 50 years. Uh, and, and so few and far between in these conversations do we acknowledge that. So I just wanted to, and again, that's not specific to this site. I support Councilwoman uh, Spencer and whatever she wants to do here. I just wanted to say that in general, um, you know, we, we, we let off the, the urban sprawl every time we have this conversation. I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure that we didn't do it on this one. Um, the sprawl in our region has devastated the environment. Uh, and so reinvestment in the urban core is just fundamentally better environmentally than sprawl. That's all I wanted to say, Mr. Chair. Now I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, uh, Shannon, do you have an additional comment? Yeah, if I could just make an additional comment. So this is, um, you know, like, honestly, whichever way this goes, it goes, right? Um, but my, the biggest concern here is along Herman south side of Herman and West 65th here, where those houses already pretty much come to the lot line. And so, and they have shallow lots. So the existing map setbacks are five and 10 feet respectively. Nothing on that corner of West 65th goes back 10 feet. And so should fire or anything of that sort happen, um, they would not be able to rebuild those homes on those lots. So if you want to amend this in some way, maybe not pass the full legislation around Cass and West 54th, um, and then also the area around Breakwater between West 54th and West 58th, uh, you'll see those buildings that are already existing, 
they're already at the lot lines as well. Um, and so, I mean, it's up to you. It, it's not, it's not a win or lose situation either way this goes. If you want to table it or dismiss it, or we can let it die, you know, <laughs> whatever you want. Well, like, just it's, really, to, just, you know, it's up just, to you and how you feel that this should best yeah. move forward. Just, uh, just to clarify, so we don't alarm residents, um, they can rebuild, but they would just need a variance. That's correct. Yeah, so they, yeah. Um, so uh, it sounds like, uh, Councilman, um, uh, the general direction today is to hold the legislation and sit back and and, uh, and then work with Shannon and and, and uh, talk with the residents. Is, is that the direction you're rolling in? Yeah, I mean, I think a little more education would be needed if, if you know, planning recommends moving forward for some of the reasons, that, the act of God reasons that Shannon has mentioned. Um, if planning recommends moving forward, I think a little more resident um, education or engagement would be would be welcome. Um, otherwise, you know, it adds a layer to the process. But as as the chair mentioned, you can seek variances, and especially for some of the large scale projects that would be looked at very comprehensively. I think that the nature of that those, those projects would be so in, in, in get involved that this would. Um, kind of be rolled into the process is looking at setbacks, looking at overall urban form. And I think it would create, you know, there would be healthy uh, dialogue regardless. Uh, Councilman Bashir Jones, uh, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, Councilman Spencer, good stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, did a, she, uh, he did a great job and uh, this is the type of leadership that our communities need, um, thoughtful. Um, courageous, uh, not just going with the flow. Um, so I just wanted to, to just make that clear. Thank you, Councilman Spencer. That's beautiful. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Shannon? Yeah, I just want to just point out that front, so the board is very limited in being able to grant front yard setbacks. And so the specific map setbacks address the front yard. So sometimes they can grant it if the developer or the homeowner can prove and 150 feet in each direction um, that, you know, that they match the setback, but the board is very limited in front yard setbacks. So just to, so you all are aware. Um, the, uh, I think at this point, um, I would uh, entertain with our, if it's okay with our committee members, um, let's uh, hold um, 63, 2019 and, uh, and then, uh, uh, Councilman Spencer, then you could uh, uh, um, inform us on um, when that gets brought back. Um, if there's no objection, we will hold 63-2019. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. That was that was your half hour, uh, Councilman Spencer. So you know, I think you owe the committee a few more uh, meetings. Um, Thanks everyone for having me. The, the next uh, uh, the next uh, ordinance we have is. Um, 35 2020 by council member McCormick designating former Cleveland Police Department Riverbed Academy, AKA former Cleveland Fire Department Engine Company 15 Fire Boat Station as a Cleveland landmark. Who is presenting this one? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Don Pettit, Secretary of the Landmarks Commission. I'll be introducing it, and Carl Grunges of our staff will be presenting the history and significance of the building. Thank you, Don. Uh, I've always admired this building architecturally. I've always known it as the former offices of the Flats Oxbow Association. It turns out it has a much richer history and I'll turn this over to Carl to uh, tell you about the history and significance of the building. Thank you, Mr. Pettit. Good morning, everybody on the committee. I'm here to introduce this, the former Cleveland Police Department Riverbed Academy at 1283 Riverbed Street. Here in context, you can see it right by the Center Street Swing Bridge along the, in the West Bank of the Flats. So on September 7th, 1884, the largest fire in the history of the city threatened to wipe out the entire downtown area. First alarm was at 6.57 a.m with the fire starting in the lumber yards. By 7.50 a.m., all city engines were called into service. This is also the first time that mutual aid was called into the city. 
They had fire departments from Erie, Sandusky, Elyria, Akron, Lorraine, Youngstown, Painesville, Toledo, Columbus, Ashtabula, Delaware, and Norwalk all called in to assist with this fire. After this was put out, two weeks later, another fire was started at 11 a.m. and was extinguished quickly, but two additional arson fires were started simultaneously a few hours later, and mutual aid was again called in from multiple cities. These events called into attention for the need for fireboats because of the access to these areas. The first fireboat was launched on August 4th, 1886, and put into service later that year, with Engine Company 15 being established on November 1st. It was named the Joseph C. Weatherly after a chief of the Volunteer Fire Department in 1840-41, and the first president of the Board of Trade. During its early history, the boat tied up excuse me, at various locations with the men living on the boat. And then in August 1889, they moved into a berth underneath the Superior Viaduct with quarters and workshops built by the firemen. The second fireboat, pictured here, was launched in 1894 and was named after Mayor John H. Farley and was stationed at the Lower Seneca Street Bridge. The Weatherly was condemned and replaced by a new wooden boat, the Clevelander, which launched on March 15, 1894 and was placed into service in June. Here you can see the Clevelander at that location at its berth underneath the bridge. And here's the original engine company number 15 staff. In 1903, a runaway B&O freight car partially destroyed the station. And it was proposed to move the station to a city owned parcel near Center Street on the west side of the river. And you can see a moment there, leisure. Was that Palencic on the, oh. <laughs> sorry. The land originally housed a washboard factory and a fish warehouse prior to the station being erected there. City of Cleveland obtained the property in for $35,000, which is about 1.1 million in today's dollars in February, 1899. And a new house for the crew was finished in late 1920, occupied in January, 1921. Although there are some other sources that say that the company moved into the new station in July of 1921. It is a utilitarian building, but it has Spanish eclectic elements. And you can see here early in its history, 1925. The uh, Clevelander was a uh, Clivers remodeled and renamed the George A. Wallace as a surprise for a respected fire chief. And there's a picture of him in his younger days. They remained in that station for a number of years and then eventually it closed because they were not able to fix the boat. And later on, 1934, it was considered inoperable and they did not have money to, and they disbanded the fire company is vacated by the fire department. In December of 1935, Mayor Harold Burton appointed Elliot Ness as the safety director for the city of Cleveland. He had been in Cleveland prior to this as an investigator in charge of the federal alcohol tax unit. And his job was to come in and make sweeping changes to the fire department and police department and safety for the city in general. As part of those improvements, he made much, this is the first major police reform in the city. And he moved for improvements in the hiring process. He, more rigid requirements for civil service exams were given to candidates. He did character investigations and fingerprinting, uh, different requirements for admission and promotion. Uh, they were testing the candidates temperamental as well as mental and physical fitness to become a policeman. And he adopted measures to improve morale of the current force. And the main thing he did was he established the police training school. This is the first official police academy location that the city ever had. The first training that occurred in this building was for the newly created traffic safety program, which introduced the field sobriety testing and accident investigations. And this 
was also part of the sweeping change for safety, for pedestrian safety and traffic safety, because Cleveland had one of the worst records for drunk driving and such. In 1935, there were 201 traffic fatalities in the city of Cleveland. They had to go through, and then they put, is a three month course, and then they would uh, put the teams out in two men teams in special vehicles to do these investigations. And on June 15th, 1937, the first formal police training class started in that building. And that's that first training class there. And that started on June 15th, 1937. So this building also served as the Harbor Master's house. Uh, it was renovated for use as a fire station in 1954 after the police academy vacated and reestablished engine company 15. 15 again disbanded and it had various uses including the Axe Flats Oxbow Association and it's been vacant since 2011. We have a few additional pictures through the years. This is a city owned property and we did have to go through and get approval by Chief Brown and Director Cox. And this came to our attention because uh, we were still doing the vision for the Valley project and it was felt that this made a natural location as part of a reuse product project because of its dock. It, potentially has the ability to be a water taxi stop. The building has potential for being a museum, a visitor center, a restaurant. So reuse and in its location, it would be good. We were asked to make sure that the designation kept clear of the swing bridge operation and of the bulkhead. And as such, the legislation reads that this designation is for the building only and not for the park area. Thank you. I think you're muted. You're muted, Mr. Chairman. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Thank you very much, Carl and Don. Uh, just an amazing, fascinating history um, of, of, that, uh, of that house. And uh, uh, I've had the pleasure of being in there a number of times and it is really a, a unique structure and a great piece of history along the riverbed. Um, this is the public portion comment. Uh, Madam Clerk, did you receive any additional uh, comments on uh, 35 2020? No, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, thank you. We'll close the public portion. We'll open this up to council. Council Member McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I just want to thank the landmark staff for their continued diligent work. Um, this is a, and I'm quite frankly surprised we didn't do this a long time ago, Mr. Chair. This is a, a really, I, I've actually also had the pleasure of walking through it. Um, it's a really exciting historical building um, in the waterfront district neighborhood of Ward 3. Um, that is the new name. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's as Carl just went through, has a long history to it. Um, I think it's, you know, historically and architecturally significant as well. Um, and there's been a lot of chatter in the neighborhood about its future, really good stuff, right? So there's a lot of residents interested in what it could become, um, you know, proposals like an educational center partnering with CMSD, partnered with a museum and all sorts of really interesting ideas. So nonetheless, Mr. Chair, this uh, landmark designation just advances those conversations. I think it, 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 it promotes and um, uh, complements those conversations. So um, again, I wanna thank the landmark staff for their research and their hard work on this. And I fully support um, this legislation and I look forward to seeing what this building could become. Great. Um, yeah, it is fascinating that uh, Elliot Ness was the first to bring on all the, uh, the background checks and all the requirements of, of uh, understanding recruits. Um, uh, and that happened through this, uh, through this building. 
And uh, I, I think, uh, Councilman, your, your point on CMSD is, is well taken, seeing what they were doing, what's going on over by MCPC, by the boathouse, the foundry with CMSD, you know, open up educational opportunities for young children along the river is just a, a, a really uh, intriguing opportunity. I do not see any additional hands uh, raised. Um, so without any additional comment, uh, 35 2020 stands approved as read. So thank you very much. The next piece we have up is uh, 291 2020 by Council Member McCormick designating the John Heisman birthplace as a Cleveland landmark. Um, who is uh, presenting this one? I'll, I'll be introducing again. Mr. Okay, Don. All right. Uh, it's, it's not often that we uh, have a nomination for Cleveland Landmark that has national significance. Uh, in this case, I think we do. It's, this is also the culmination of a long effort to correct the historic record uh, and, and get, get the actual location right. And I'll turn it over to Carl Brunges now to talk about the history and the effort to uh, relocate the, the correct marker for the Heisman birthplace. Thank you, Mr. Pettit. On May 11th, 1978, to great pomp and circumstance, the John Heisman birthplace marker was placed in front of the home and former Ohio State Heisman Trophy winners were in attendance. The St. Ignatius Band played and a great crowd was gathered for this event. Here it is, the birth site. It's appropriate that it would be placed in front of the residence of where he was born. And it, as Mr. Pettit said, it should be marked. Or is it in the right place? <laughs> Brought my challenge flag. Landmark Commission <laughs> staff is challenging the ruling that the Heisman marker is in front of the correct house. So the questions that were raised for this is here he was born on October 3rd, 1869. They got this from the Cuyahoga birth records. But unfortunately, there's a lot of errors as somebody who does genealogy and does a lot of research in these records. There are quite a few records in the early county records. So the Sarah Heisman family Bible was found and it noted that his actual birth date was October 23rd, 1869. So that was an important error that was found on that marker. And almost from the beginning, there's been questions if this marker was in the right place. In 1984, uh, there was an article by reporter Thomas Andrewski noting the discrepancies in the story and felt the location was further up at 4006-4008 Bridge Avenue. And they kind of left it because there were multiple houses on the site. So that was question number one. A few years later, Jim Mesker, who was a local resident, actually found the second house where Sarah Heisman owned the property and it was not in Michael Heisman's name. So here are the parcels in question. And we, we see that Michael Heisman had his cooperage at 189 Bridge but the home was at 183 Bridge. So you see the cooperage here, and then this would be the residence here. Local historian Craig Bott, Bobby fully documented the location in 2002, and with this evidence, he wrote to the Ohio History Office about moving the marker to the correct location. And then Christopher Bustapec also confirmed the location in his 2009 blog post for area, Cleveland area history. So the correct house is at 3928 Bridge Avenue. And it, it's built in two sections. The front section would be the more appropriate original section. And there was a 1906 edition in the back. So the question is, how did this error occur? And when they originally placed the marker, although the information they had was technically correct, it was incomplete. And the first thing we know, Currently, our streets are named after, changed after the 1905 ordinance. Um, and the reason for that was that you could go block to block within the city and not have the same numbers lining up street to street. And it caused a lot of confusion and still causes a lot of confusion today. 
part of that was because in the 1894 95 street numbering changes some streets had the odd and even numbers change sides of the street it didn't happen everywhere just in select locations and that's what happened on bridge so here i used the house that was at the corner of bridge and randall which is still there um, and it had a different address then and then you can see that it switched there but because it also had a an address on the randall side that didn't change so we can see that using that same block that it that's what happened to it there and that's what caused the confusion so in 1869 city directory has him living at 183 bridge avenue the tax duplicates have sublot 593 and this is how we eliminated all this and then there was a fiscal officer rep recording the sale of the property to heisman in 1868 but then when they sold the property it actually spelled out exactly where the house was and it was on the north side and it was 183 bridge street so gathering all this information is how we finally confirmed this so moving the marker because the marker already has errors in it and needs to be corrected, that one is being taken out of service and removed and a new one was commissioned and that has been purchased, it has been updated, it's ready to be installed. We are currently working with uh, the city to have this installed, but we have to wait for the original one to be removed first before the new one goes in. Um, we are in the process of getting the license agreements, um, the, current owners of the house have agreed to have it placed and we are happy to be moving forward with this and correcting the error after all this time and we have to acknowledge all those people that did put in that research prior to us being able to put this together thank you great thank you very much uh for that history um madam clerk did you get this is the public portion did you get any uh, additional uh, correspondence on this no, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. I do want to acknowledge I did get correspondence from uh, Faye Harris, um, who was uh, uh, moving forward and supporting this. Um, and with that, I will close the public comment and uh, open it up to council. Council Member McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I fully support this legislation. This is the proper placement of the Heisman marker in the Ohio City, city neighborhood. Um, in addition to um, the correct placement, the sign is, you know, turning into a little bit of disrepair. So it'd be good to have a, a new sign um, that is, has the accurate information and that is in better condition. Um, Mr. Chair, I wanted to thank uh, one of our community residents in Ohio City, uh, Ms. Faye Harris, who um, has taken on this initiative and really um, led it, you know, and, in, 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 you know, jumped over all the hurdles she's had to do and spent the time and energy as a volunteer to get this done. Um, so I really wanna call her out and thank her for her work on this and for really making this happen. So um, I'm excited about this. Um, this is gonna be a great uh, addition to uh, the, uh, the new house in the neighborhood. And um, you know the community is excited to, to have this and hopefully we can have some sort of uh, something celebration at some point. Uh, I don't know what that looks like with COVID, but um, uh, fully support this legislation. Uh, and again, I thank our community members who have been involved in, in this process. Great, thank you, Councilman. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, I'm not sure, but um, was this the uh, statue that was uh, gonna go up in, uh, um the in front of the house all right yeah you know, uh, i don't know how <laughs> sorry about gonna, that <laughs> how we can incorporate that in but we got to um thank you all very much for your hard work on this uh, i do not see any additional comments um uh, ordinance number 291 2020 stands approved as read thank you both uh, donna carl for your hard work on this um, and I, that is all the legislation we have. I don't. I want to make sure we acknowledge our new vice chair, 
uh, Councilman Anthony Harrison. Uh, welcome, Anthony, as vice chair. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Councilman Cleveland told you you were supposed to bring the chairperson donuts on uh, your first day, but uh, I'll, you know, given COVID, we'll let that go. She, she did not, but I'll be prepared for next time. <laughs> um, thank you all very much, and uh, I will see you all again next Tuesday. Uh, have a great day. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Take care.